All right, today we're going to look at evaluating a guitar that is pretty good. So I have a couple of videos on evaluating a 70s um, B41, a HD28, and things like that. But those guitars had a lot of problems with them. And this is a guitar that really doesn't have very many problems at all. In fact, you could probably play this just like it is right now. Uh, I already did on the videos. It is the D18-1939 Authentic Age. And I already played it in a comparison video just like this. But my job is not to play the guitar for you know, my fun and enjoyment. My job is to um, take a look at it and see if there's anything that needs to be done to it. So the first thing I notice, <clears throat> it's brand new. It is stock. Nothing else has been done to it. And the first thing I notice is the action is just a little high for me. It could be a little more comfortable. So I'm going to measure it. I'm going to get some feeler gauges out here. And this is 103.103 thousandths of an inch. And fits under the low E here. A little bit of tack. You could call that 105 if you wanted to. I would rather see it around 93, so let's just say 95. So I'd rather see it at 10 thousandths of an inch lower. Be a little bit more comfortable for me. Let's see what the treble's doing. <clears throat> I'm going to load up 90 thousandths of an inch of feeler gauges. I'm just going to slide across right here. It's clear and clear and clear and clear. The B is about 93. And the high E is about 90. So yeah, <clears throat> I would personally would rather see something closer to 95 and 80. So I would like to drop the whole thing um, 10 thousandths of an inch. Now, to do that, you would adjust the saddle normally. But the saddle on this guitar is original, and it looks really nice. In other words, the height is nice. I'm going to find out for sure. Here's a pair of calipers. Slap it on there right next to the low E string. And I've got 135 thousandths of an inch, which to me is just perfect. I'm really reluctant to drop that saddle because I have to drop it 20 thousandths of an inch, you understand. If I'm going to drop 10 here, it takes twice that much over here and I have to drop a 20. And I'm going to end up with a 115, which is okay. You know, I, I like this one, you know, I like the 135. So what I'm doing is here, I'm, I'm giving you my thought process as I evaluate this. If this saddle was 155, I'd have no problem with taking 20 thousandths of an inch off of it and dropping it down to 135 and dropping this to 95 and then everything would be perfect as far as I'm concerned, you know, to my set of specs. That would be perfect. 135 is perfect right now. 125 would be acceptable. But 125 is only going to drop this five thousandths of an inch, and it's just not enough. So I'm still evaluating here, okay? I like the saddle. I love the saddle. The action's high. So, what's the, act, what's the saddle on the treble side here? I know it's lower, but how much lower? 130. I don't really want to drop that to 110, if I can avoid it. Alright, so there's two other things that influence affect the action itself now let me define this again i've defined it in other videos but i'm going to define it for you again right here action is the height of the string off of the fret that's all it is so you can talk about the first fret action you can talk about the action at the sixth fret you can talk about the action up here at the twelfth fret you can even fret this and fret this and talk about the relief action. So just because the string is high does not necessarily mean that the guitar is going to be buzz resistant. And I've demonstrated this before. So you got this guitar and you got this action, right? If I take, I'm going to get this little piece of wood here, and I'm going to slide this up under the strings. I'm going to bring it up here. I'm going to make essentially what is a high nut. Wow, the action went sky high. But I didn't change a single thing on the guitar, did I? All I did was simulate a very high nut. 
and I made that action high. But when I pitched the note to the fret down here, it is exactly the same as it was before. So I'm pressing on the, um, let's go to the fifth fret, so I know where the dot is. No, run at the seventh fret. I'm gonna press the string at the seventh fret, and it's got that much clearance at the eighth fret. If I take my piece of stick out and do the same thing, it didn't change anything, did it? This clearance is still exactly the same because the nut is what's going up and down. So I get people all the time that say my action's high, do I need to, or I'm getting string buzz up here, do I need to raise my nut? Well, the nut is not going to affect from a fretted note down, okay? And I just demonstrated to you again that there are things that can affect the action that will not affect the buzz freeness of it. They affect the playability of the guitar, but they don't affect the ability of it to resist buzzes. Okay, you got that? So, given that, and given that this action is just a little high, 10 thousandths of an inch, the next thing I'm going to look at is the actual nut. What's the nut like, you know? Because I didn't cut this nut. <laughs> and so, I suspect it. I always look at it to verify the thing. So, what I do to check the nut really quickly is fret between the second and the third frets. And I want that string to just absolutely, barely, barely, barely clear the first fret. And I've got quite a bit of clearance right there. I'm pushing on that. So with the sixth string, I'm going to push the string down here. I'm going to check it again. That one's a little high. The A string is, is kind of high. Hmm. So I'm looking at that nut now, and I'm thinking, I wonder, I, th I think I can drop that nut. The nut will affect the action up here more than you think. You know, mathematically, there's a relationship, but things happen on a guitar. Uh, you know, your forces change, your torques change, stuff like that changes. And when I adjust that nut, it's going to drop this more than you think and I would demonstrate it just so we know so to verify my measurement now see I this is just a quick and dirty check and I look at that and I think yeah I might be able to drop down a little bit more so to verify that I'm going to get a set of feeler gauges up here I'm going to get 12 14 and 16 and that's just my array 12, 14, and 16. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to press the string down at the first fret. I'm going to measure the clearance at the second fret. Let's see what we get here. It's really, really, in fact, it's essential when you do this kind of thing to have a light. I've got a light right here, so I've got a backlight shining down right smack on here. And I can see the shadow that it's leaving on this field gauge. And I can see the gap right there, and that's a 12 thousandths, that's a 12. And it's clearing with just a tiny little bit, so I'm going to try a 14. People say sometimes, you know, oh, you can't be that accurate, but you know what? I'm out there shimming the valves on my um, Kawasaki KX250F, which is a four-stroke motorcycle, and I am using the absolute smallest feeler gauges that I, that I have down here. The exhaust has to be between six and eight thousandths of an inch. It has to be between six and eight. If it does not, you're going to blow your bike up. This set of feeler gauges doesn't even have a seventh thousandths. It's got a six to eight. So I have another set of feeler gauges down at the barn that's more accurate, more detailed, and it's got a seven. The six clears and the seven does not. And I mean, it's night and day. Six clears, seventh is not. One thousandth of an inch. So, if you can measure the greasy valves on a motorcycle, and you better be able to, I guarantee you, you can measure a nice, friendly guitar. So, the 12 cleared. I'm going to come in with the 14 and see what I get. I can clear it. You can also reach up here like this. This is tricky. You put your feeler gauge down here. You make sure it's parallel to the string and tap on it. 
I get absolutely the very slightest tap. So I'm going to go with this gap being 14 thousandths of an inch. So when I fret the first fret and I get 14 thousandths of an inch here, then when I back up here and put my finger on the nut, then the clearance here at the first fret should be 16 thousandths of an inch. This is 14, so this should be 16, two thousandths of an inch larger. And I'm going to call it 18 just to give it some room for the, uh, for the nut to wear and things to change. So given that I want to see about 18 thousandths of an inch right there, what do we have? Here's an 18 and here's a 20. Let's just try the 20 first. 20 clears with about 2 thousandths of an inch extra. So the 18, this is the one I really want. Got a lot of clearance. So I can lower the nut. When I do, the action is going to change more than you might think it would change. Mm, here's your 22. Let's see what we got. Twenty-two just barely clears. Yeah, twenty-two thousandths of an inch. So I can drop this four thousandths of an inch. As long as I have a set of feeler gauges in my hand here, I'm going to take a look at the other strings real quick. So I'm going to load up an eighteen, a sixteen, and a fourteen. And I'm going to come across these just to see what they are. And I know that they're not going to be higher than eighteen. You see the same. I know the low E is going to be the highest one, and I know I want it to be 18. So the others are better be lower than 18. They should be between 16 and 14, you know. I usually want to see the 18 on the A, 16, 16, 14, and 14, something like that. Let's just see what we get here. So here's an 18. And I got lots of clearance here. Over on the D string, the 18 is clearing. Over on the G string, the 18 is clearing. And the B string, the 18 is really clearing. And on the high, the 18 is clearing. So I'm uh, positive now that I can lower that nut. I verified it by using the second fret to the third fret. And then I double check it using a set of feeler gauges. So just to see what it should be, I'm going to load up a 16 and a 14 here. I'm going to hold the G string down on the first fret. And I'm going to measure the second fret clearance. I'm going to start with a 16. It is not clear. Let's try a 14. G string, second fret. You got to get, when you do this, you got to get your feeling gauge flat down on the fret. So you got to push your other strings down, keep it flat. And 14 just clears. So I want that first fret to be a 16. Which is what my experience says it should be, you know. So here's a sixteen thousandths of an inch. G string open. And it clears by a lot. It clears by a lot. So I'm gonna lower the nut. Alright, remember what we're trying to do here is get the action down without shaving the saddle yet. Don't just go dropping the saddle. Check the other things first because the nut's high. So I'm going to lower the nut, that's going to lower the action a little bit, and then I'm going to be able to take less off of the saddle. Okay, so let me repeat that, because that is a critical, important point. Just because the action is high, doesn't mean you should immediately lower the saddle. Look at the other parts of the system first. And in this case, I'm going to lower the nut slots a little bit, that's going to drop the action, and that means I'm going to lower the saddle less than I started with. So the next thing I need to check that affects the action is the neck relief. Now this guitar has a non-adjustable truss rod, so there's not a whole lot I can do on this right now. There are ways I can get the relief down, but not on this guitar right now. But I do want to know what the relief is, because if it's got excess relief, that's the bow in the neck. If it's got an excess relief, I can't drop this too low or it's going to start buzzing right up in here. You need to have your neck as flat and straight as you possibly can get it. The only reason, in my humble opinion, experience, and I have 
data and reasons to back this up. The only real reason you need any neck relief whatsoever is to keep the neck from back bowing if the humidity goes up. Because the humidity is going to change and the neck is going to go a little bit back and forth. So you need just a tiny bit of relief so that you can see that it's not back bowed. For instance, on the KX250 valves, I'm measuring it and I get six thousandths of an inch of relief or of, um, clearance. So I can calculate what size of shim I need to put in there to get the valve clearance to where I want it. But if I measured it and I got no clearance, then I don't know how much I need. So I have to throw a shim in there so that I can get some clearance that I can measure. And then I can calculate where I need to be. The same thing as if you had zero relief, you don't know if you have a back bow. You know, is it back bowed or is it flat? Mm, you don't know. You've got to get a little bit of relief in there so that you can measure it and say, okay, there it is. If you ever build um, fences, lay out any kind of business construction stuff, this is something I learned. When you lay out your string, you do not want it touching the marker. You want it to have about like an eighth of an inch clearance, you know, just the smallest amount of clearance off of that stick so that you can tell that it's not touching it and bending backwards. If it's touching, you don't know if it's if if you've got your your string crooked, you know. You got to have just the slightest bit of clearance away from your marker stick, and it should be the same amount of clearance, obviously, you know. So, okay, so that's the same principle going on here. So let's check the neck relief. I'm gonna put a capo at the first fret just to make it easier on me because I'm gonna actually measure it. I'm gonna load up an eight thousandths of an inch feeler gauge. I'm going to hold down the uh, D string here at the 12th fret, and I'm going to measure at the 6th fret, which is halfway. Eight thousandths is not clear, so that's good, you know. I like to see somewhere between, I like to see four thousandths of an inch. And I'm willing to have a little bit of, you know, let's try five. You know, five is cut off. It lost its life and duty so the d string um sixth fret again that's the seventh fret you dummy sixth fret it clears by just a little bit so your leaf on this guitar is probably about six thousandths of an inch um that's acceptable you know it'd be nice if it was four three just just a hair flatter but when it comes time to refret it then that's when i can get that relief down just a little bit Either by either by putting it into the frets itself or by um, using compression fret on some of these key frets. Compression frets have a thicker tang, and they don't force the neck back, but they hold the neck in place. However, this has got a T-bar in it, which is pretty strong, so I don't anticipate this relief changing much. So I'm pretty comfortable with um, six thousandths of an inch. You know, that, that, that's acceptable. In any case, I'm not going to gain any action adjustment from the relief. I am going to gain a little bit of here at the nut. So let's go ahead and adjust the nut and I will probably just do one or two and then I'm going to cut the video and then I'll come back after I've done. Because I've already got other videos on adjusting the nut and I want you to be able to get through this one in less than an hour. My point of all this is that I am considering just flat out resetting the neck on this guitar. And yeah, I know it's a brand new guitar and I know it's straight from the factory and all that kind of thing. But I would like for this guitar to be perfect. The factory has got a set of standards. And as long as the guitar is between here and here, they're happy. Their standards are over here. My standards are back of that. And I would like for this guitar to be perfect because it is a really nice guitar. And it kind of irritates me, irks me, grates on me that it's not as perfect as it could be. So, you know, that's what I'm toying around with here in my head. I'm toying around with the idea of actually resetting the neck to drop the action to match that stock shadow, which is perfect. But I don't think we're going to have to. I think I'm going to lower this and it's going to drop the action a surprising amount. So, all right, I'm going to start here. And remember, I wanted to see... Fourteen thousandths of an inch on the on the high E. 
I want to shoot 14, 16, 18, 18, yeah, probably 14, 16, 16, 16, 18, 18. And um, and I'll be checking it with the uh, with the gap method too. But I like to measure the open string because it's a bigger gap. It's easier for me to do. So I'm gonna rip the string out of here, set it over in the B string slot, pick up a 13 file, and I'm gonna file this just a tiny bit. Again. When you do the nut slots, split the distance between the fingerboard plane and the plane down to the tuner. So here's the plane to the tuner, right there. I'm touching the tuner hole. Here's the plane off the fingerboard, and I want to split it about right there. I also like to take it and the very last stroke and roll it so that the the slot is curved on the outgoing end. You don't want to roll too much because if you have a gap between the string and the slot it'll vibrate right there and make a really irritating sound. Ouch. You don't want to do that. I pretty much use the gap method here um, as I'm working. I don't measure it every single time. A lot of times when you do these nut slots there's gunk in the slot and you get too aggressive on your filing, you file a gunk out, which was really the problem, and then you file the nut slot, and then you're in trouble. So check it frequently. It's a lot easier to check it than it is to make a new nut because you screwed up. That is a prime example of what I'm talking about because that touched the fret right there. Just that little stroke. So I got a 14. Unfortunately, I nailed it. Exactly. But that's a prime example of what I'm talking about. The first stroke didn't do a whole lot, so I thought, okay. And I filed on a little bit, and whoo, man, it dropped it. Fast. So just as an example, remember this was um, 90 thousandths of an inch when we started. I dropped it at the nut just a little. Let's go over here and see what we got now. I'm just going to go ahead and go with a um, 84. 84 thousandths of an inch. Come back over here. Just close. I think it's probably about 86 thousandths of an inch. So, we're not done yet though. Keep going. Lift the B and I'm going to slide it over and set it on the E slot. Man, I see guys doing this and they take all the strings off every time and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's like, man, it's got gunk in the slot for sure. <laughs> the A is coming down just a little bit more. I've got the E right at 18, which is where I want it. And the A is just a hair higher, so that's going to feel just a little funny if I don't get it right. That's my 46. Get, get this A exactly right. That's good right there. It's just barely clear in the front. Perfect. Got it. 18. Okay, now let's see what happened to our action. I started at 105 down to 90. I dropped the nut slots. <clears throat> Let's see what we got here. I start with the same 105 again, 103. And it bumps into it. Bump. So we lowered it. How much? Let's try, let's try 98. Now if it's 98, then I'm comfortable with lowering the saddle. Because it'll take 98, 93, 5,000s of an inch, I'll have to load the saddle, 10,000s of an inch. That'd be very acceptable to me. It's 98 and it's making some noise.
They're all pretty much 98, except for the high E. And I can see the saddle curving like that, so. Yeah, high E is 90 still. Because it went down just a little bit. So, but that's okay. We're getting there. At 98 across the board. So I would like for this to be 87 on the uh, D and the G. So that's going to take a 20,000 of an inch drop on the D and the G. And the shadow there. It's 130. It's going to drop to 110. Mm. <laughs> I'm still thinking about resetting the neck. Um, it's not that bad. Okay, here's the deal. Even though I, I told you it's a it's a two to one ratio, so ten thousandths of an inch here is twenty thousandths of an inch here. In reality, it doesn't work out to be an exactly a two to one ratio. First of all, um, due to the mathematics of the thing, it's really more like about a one point eight relationship. And then, secondly, by the time you lower the saddle, there's a little less stress on the top, a little less stress and torque on the neck. And that has an effect. So it really ends up being about like 175 in, in practical purposes. So if I, um, I'm getting about 100,000, I'm still getting about maybe a 102. I still don't have to drop at 20,000 of an inch. But take 20,000 and, and multiply it by um, 0.75. And you're really looking at maybe 15,000 of an inch. And that's 135. 140. 145. So you got to come back and remeasure a couple of times. I'm getting 140, 145. If I drop it uh, 15,007 inches, that'd be 130. That's, a, that's very acceptable. I don't think I'm going to reset the neck. No. I'm going to go ahead and take the saddle down. And get the action right. I made a plan a whole lot better already by lowering the nut. You'd be amazed how much difference the nut makes up to the fifth fret as far as your playing. I mean, it changes a couple thousandths of an inch up here. So you can imagine what it's doing up into here. It's going to make it pretty good and it's not bad right now so I feel pretty comfortable with taking the shadow down yeah so here we go the other thing I'm gonna do this guitar while we're evaluating it is um, fix the bridge pins these are ebony bridge pins which are okay but they don't fit see how they're sticking up above the collars I hate that the collars are there to keep the pin from getting pushed into the bridge. So if you're sitting up above the collar, you're just using a wedge right now. Plus these are ebony bridge pins, which is okay, but both the owner and I would really rather see antique acoustic bridge pins in here. They're much more like what the original uh, pre-war pins would be. I have had original pre-war pins in my hand, and the antique acoustics are very, very close. When you drop them and listen to them, they make the same sort of sound. Ebony goes thump. Uh, so I like ebony on really bright guitars when I'm trying to tone down the treble. But on this guitar, we want it to be as authentic as possible. And I'm gonna put um, antique acoustic bridge pins in here. And I'm gonna seat them. I'm gonna make sure the slotting is good. And when I slot that bridge, I'm gonna be able to give it a little bit more string angle. So the saddle height is gonna be good when I get done. Like I said, I made the first four frets, first five frets play better already by dropping the nut just a little. And it's three or four thousandths of an inch, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but I guarantee you that up here at the nut, that's a big deal. So, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the strings off. I'm going to measure the saddle. I'm going to determine how much I need to take it down, and then I'm going to take it down. And I will show you how to do all this. Um, again, I'm probably going to trim the video a little bit for make it easier, but we'll go through the process. So, all right, we're back. 
on this D18. B, I've taken the strings off of it and check for the pins. And here's the thing, uh, those other pins, the ebony ones are sitting high. These are the antique acoustics and pop, they just dropped right in perfectly. So, uh, you know, when you get pins, you gotta check. Not all pins are consistent. And these look like they've been sanded down or something to fit. But they're all oversized pins, I guess. Anyway, the AAs dropped right in. I didn't have to ream. I didn't have to do anything. So, got my sheet. And you've seen this before, but I'm going to show it to you again, just in case this is the first video you've watched. And basically what I do is I record the action that I want, and then I record the action that I have. And so this was, um, I wanted a 96. I had a 103. And I had a, I forgot. <laughs> no, we had 90. Over in there. And then I had 98 going all the way across. It's on the video. I could rerun the video back and see, but I think that's about right. Of course, I'm going to have to check it anyways. So I had a 103 and then 98 all the way across, basically. So I'm going to subtract here. I'm going to mark down the amount of change. And the difference between 96 and 103 is 7, so we're going to have to drop it by 15. Because really, I'd like to have it a little bit below 96. But I just, you know, you, you, can, you can be accurate with the numbers, but the reality is something a little bit different. So you just take a shot at it, get it pretty close, and then measure the action. Sometimes it takes me two times to get, you know, exactly where I want it, but that's fine, you know. I'm not in any hurry. So 98 minus 93, uh, you've got a five difference here. That's going to be a ten thousandth of an inch drop. That's nice. Yeah, that's correct. 90 to 98, that's 16, so that's going to be a 15 inch drop. 15 thousandths. Uh, 98 minus 87, that's going to take a 20. 98 and 84, that's going to take more. I don't trust that measurement on that 98. I'm going to call that 96. I'm going to drop that one 22. And then the other one's 20. 80 to 90 is a 20 thousandths of an inch drop. So I'm looking at a 15, a 10, 15, 20, 20, 20 drop across the saddle. Now, this saddle is glued in. I'm not going to pull it out. I'm going to work on it right here on the guitar. So the first thing I'm going to do because it's, you know, I don't wanna, you need to protect the instrument. So, let me get these covers out. I use these for heating bridges and things like that, but they're good covers. They fit over the bridge like that. Bam. Now I protected the top. So when I drop my calipers, hopefully I don't dent anything. Come back here, and you need to measure consistently. When I had the strings on, I was measuring from the front of the saddle over here, as close as I could get. But now that I'm actually right on the string, and now the strings are out of the way. I'm going to put this right where the slot is. I'm going to drop it down. And 130. Yikes. One thirty-five. You gotta to try to get your caliper straight up and down. 135, 137. I'm gonna go with 135. So by the time I drop 15, I'm gonna look for 120. And that's not bad. You know, I'm happy with 120 thousandths. 120 thousandths. I'm happy with 120. And over here, on the A. 130. 130. That's good. I'm going to drop that 15. That's going to be 115. That's still okay. You know, anything down to 110 is all right. 130. Yeah, good solid 130. I'm going to drop that one 15. That's going to be 115. So I'm guessing, looking at that 120, 115, 115. God, I wish I could keep that 130. That's going to be 110. You know, that's pushing it for me, but 
It's still all right because it's going to have a pretty good break angle. One thirty. It's going to drop twenty. That's going to be one ten. And then the last one. One twenty five. 25 again, that's going to drop 20 thousandths of an inch, and that's going to be one, uh, 125 minus 20, 125 minus 20, God, 105. <laughs> yeah, that's just a little bit low on the E, but it's not bad still. We'll make it work. Again, I might stop just a little short of that and remeasure, because like I said, uh, I'm using a 2 to 1 ratio right now. It's really about like 175, so I'm not going to go any lower than that. Okay? Now what I'll do is get my file, which I forgot. I'll show you what else you can use. In fact, I'll just use this. This is a utility razor blade. And instead of filing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrape. So I'm looking for 15, 10, 15, 20, 20, 20. So I'm just going to hold this razor blade straight across here. I'm just going to scrape it. This is a fossil wall or fossil ivory saddle, I'm pretty sure. It scrapes beautifully. You hold your fingers on the sides like this and balance it. Keeps you from wobbling back and forth and scraping the bridge up or something stupid like that. Always, if you're not comfortable with your tools, find a tool you're comfortable with. You've got to be comfortable with the tool. So, if you're not comfortable holding the razor blade straight, don't use it. Use something else, okay? I like to scrape both ways too. I also like to hold it a little bit of an angle as I'm going across. So I don't hold it straight across, I hold it at an angle and go across. It pushes all the shavings to one side and if I hit um, a string groove or something it'll slide over the string groove. So like I ride on a ranch, uh, on a dirt bike and everything I ride and if there's a road, a rut, don't go straight across. You know. Go across a little bit of an angle, especially on the four wheeler, because then an ATV, because then one wheel will go across, the other wheel will go across. And so you got this wheel on good ground, the other wheel goes across, and you can go right across the rut. If you go across the rut straight across, your wheels drop in and you bounce. So it's the same principle here. Okay? I am heavily influenced by dirt bikes <laughs> in my guitar world. So I'm gonna hold this at an angle, not not uh Perpendicular to the saddle, go across at an angle. I'm working on for the G to the E right now because that's going to go 20 thousandths. The reason I go both ways is so I don't end up getting a dip in it. It's just easier to scrape this way and then this way, and I have better luck that way. Now I'm going to come over to the uh, D to the E, scrape it a little bit. I'm going to leave chatter marks, but that's okay. Check it. My little shavings out of the way. I'm looking for 120, 115, 115. One twenty-five. Oh, I don't like that one. One twenty-five. One twenty. Over here. One twenty. Let's go down about ten. One twenty-five. One twenty. Okay, that's good. If you want to use a file, this is one of my fret files, and this is the larger triangular one that I really don't use for a whole lot. I like the smaller triangle. Uh, but you need a flat surface right here so that you don't go rocking it back and forth. And you can use this too. So you hold your, hold your finger down here like this as a guide. Hold your other finger over here to keep from digging down in it. And just go straight across like that. You can do it two-handed too. 
But when you do that, the guitar likes to slide. So that's another thing about using the razor is you've got it, the guitar doesn't slide around as much, and it's hard to get it's hard to get my finger down there right now. So I'm gonna go back to the razor. Okay, much faster. Come back over to these. So I can hold the guitar down with my elbow here, keep it from moving. Let's see what we got. I think the biggest mistake people make when they're trying to work on their own instruments is they rush the job. Take your time, measure, check. 120. Getting close, about 122. 120, I'm at 115. 120, just a hair under. 115, I want 110. 115, I want 110. And 112. I'm getting pretty close on that high E. Oh, I gotta go to 105 on it. Okay, so back to work. One twenty. Actually, about one nineteen. Yeah, that's close. One sixteen. That's close enough. One sixteen. You're know, really consistent. If you look, uh, using the scraper, I've gotten very consistent results. There's no dips, anything going on there. All right, I'm going to leave it just a little high because you know I'm going to polish it. That sort of thing. I'm going to lose a thousandth of an inch there. Not to mention the 175 business. 112, that's pretty good. 111. And 108. I'm going to go just a hair more on that high E. One more swipe. Now, take a pencil, and the top of the saddle is now nice and flat. So I'm taking my pencil, I'm going to scribe pencil marks on here. And I'm going to compensate this saddle um, a little bit. I'm not going to do a really aggressive looking compensation. <clears throat> You've all seen compensations where it goes like this and then over to the B string, and, and I don't do that. I cut an even radius off, the, uh, an even slope off of it. It's kind of a Collings compensation. I'm going to draw a line right here in between the G and the B. That's my marker. Now I get this one, which is my triangular uh, fret file, the little one. I, I like this one for this quite a bit. Get some tape. And then mask off the bridge. Front and back, so I don't scratch it, hopefully. 
Just run that tape up in there, glue, stick it down to the edges of the bridge, and I got something I protected it, okay? You can do that before, too, if you're worried about scrape. Well, you won't get a good measurement when you, when you measure down and have the measure of the tape. Now, the big string needs to go as far back as it'll go. The little E goes in the middle. The low E goes as far back as it want to go. You don't want to go too, back, too much to the back. You don't want to have an edge like this on the back where it's going to break and chip. You need to have a little bit where the string's going to, going to come across. And like I said, I'm going to do kind of a, uh, a stealth compensation on this. It's not going to be super obvious. I'm going to blend everything in. And it's not going to be that serpentine thing. It's going to be pretty stealthy. So I get my file and I come in here. First thing I do is get the forward edge just a little. And then Where's my mark? Right there. I put my finger on that mark so it acts like a stop. Now I work that low, uh, the B back. I'm using my fingers here as a as a gauge. So I get a nice consistent angle on that. right to my mark okay when I get that back then I go angle this way a little bit I've got to cut across and that smooths all the little file marks in okay the bees back a little the E's are on the forward edge almost do the same thing on the low E, and I need to know where the low E is, just to be sure. Make sure I pick it up. Let me get my tape back up just a second. Right there. There's my low E, right on the scotch. And that low E and the A back a little. The A should be about in the middle. The low E is back. Around that forward edge, just a little. Let me show you. Okay, this is what it looks like. Your pencil marks are showing that I haven't I haven't moved the D and the G back at all. They're going to leave on the forward edge of the saddle. The little E is going to leave on the on the middle of it. The big E is is on the rear path of the saddle, and the A is in the middle. And you know, there's only so much compensation you can do on a three thirty seconds inch saddle, but you might as well get a little bit. You know, it'll play better up and neck in tune. Flip the guitar over, and I'm going to do the same thing working this way. Except this time I'm going to move the, uh, the G and the D all the way to the front. And then I'm going to smooth in this edge a little bit. And this one's trickier because the bridge is in the way, you see. Previously I was going past the bridge down here to the top. This one, you got to use short little strokes. And I hit it one time right there, went in the, went in the pinhole, which that's why I have the tape on there. And smooth that rear edge off a little bit. Get my face down here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay? You can also take your scraper, if you're comfortable with that, choke up on it pretty good. And you can scrape it. good we'll go over and do the same thing on the uh, B to the E section moving the E out 
We round off that edge for the B. You gotta choke up pretty hard on that razor so you don't dig it into the bridge. Again, if you're not comfortable with that, don't do it. Now I'm gonna come back with the file. Now that I've got the bulk of the of the bone gone off of there, I'm gonna come in with the file. Touch it up. And then to me, this is just like crowning a fret. I'm gonna take a file like this, and I'm gonna kind of roll it over the edge to make a smooth edge. Okay, let me show you what that looks like. Alright, you ought to be able to see the pencil marks on there. And they're a pretty consistent pencil mark. So what I'm trying to do is get the same width of edge going across and then across like this. Sometimes people have the um, the B, I'm sorry, the uh, the D and the G on too much saddle, and that makes the can make that string a little bit different sounding than the others. I try to get a, a consistent edge going across there. Now, there's a little bit of a compensation factor on the B string. Like I said, I don't want an aggressive looking one, but I'm by the time I sand it out, that's going to be smooth. And you're going to have to really look at it to see that it's compensated. The reason I'm mentioning all this is because this is um, a vintage recreation. And the vintage guitars do not have any compensation on them. So if you want to be true vintage, you're going to have just, a, just the same contact point going across here. But to me, uh, I want it to sound good. And it's not a vintage guitar. It's a, it's a modern, you know, it's a modern replication of one. So... I want to make it as good as I can get it. I want to respect the vintage, but if there's places I can improve it, I'm going to try to improve it. I'm looking for a piece of sandpaper now. Here it is. I got little pieces of this uh, 320 grit wet dry paper. I got it all over the place. So here's where I'm going to fold it in half. I'm going to dip it in water. The water is a lubricant. And then I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to sand this with my thumb to make a nice round top to it. Get rid of my file marks. This is another reason for the tape and the protector at this point. Okay, that's all it takes. You don't want to get aggressively sanding and, and ruin your measurements. Down here I got a rag that I've been using for years and it is absolutely caked with this Meguiar's number no. 2 fine cut cleaner. I probably don't even need any on here but I can go ahead and run a little bit. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, it's clogged up. I'm not going to worry about it. Still got a little water left on here from the sandpaper, and this thing is just absolutely caked in that stuff. So I'm just going to take it like that, rub it. Now the bad thing, of course, I got rid of the patina that this had on it, but it's still on the side, so we're good. A little patina up after you wear it, after you play it, and sweat on it a little bit. All right, it's pretty polished. Take your tape off. Don't want to rip up my aluminum foil there. Let's see what we got. I'm shooting for 120. That's good. Remember, I told you it could be a little less, and I'd be happy. 
115, perfect. 110, that one went down a little bit more, but that's okay. 112, and I wanted 110, that's still pretty good. 110, that one's perfect. And 105, perfect. Let me check that D again. 115, yeah, I like that. See? Check your measurements again. Ah, oh, I'm happy with that. 2007 inch off here is going to be 1007 inch here, and uh, that is completely insignificant. String it up, see what I got. A lot of people use capos and stuff up here to hold the strings. I don't like that because the capo is just always in the way. I just coil the strings up in pairs, put them up on the headstock. I always do the the E's last so that they come off first. And they don't get in the way of the other strings. Yeah, those AAs fit in there nice. Okay, here's something I noticed. Putting the string in. You look at the bend in the string, and there's a step in here where the winding is doubled. And he's got a string where that winding is on the bottom. What that's going to do is it's going to lift the string off of the bridge right there, and that can cause a buzz. It also reduces your brake angle. Flip the string over so that that winding is on the top, so that you have a nice, flat, smooth surface here on the bottom. Put it in that way. It'll increase the brake angle just a tiny bit and it makes that string go right across the bridge without having a step on it. Now I got the A and the B. And then the next to come down the line. I'm really picky about the wraps up at the headstock. I do not like over wrapping wraps. I want them really clean. I want one wrap on top and all the rest of them on the bottom. Two wraps on the bottom. Look at that string. That one's good off to the side a little bit but that's okay one thing I like to do here is kind of hold the string up out of the nut slot until it's getting down on it and I don't know maybe helps prevent wear on it the D's and the G's the D and the G and get the wraps nice Close enough, I'm not trying to get it exactly in tune, I'm just getting it um, with more or less correct amount of tension. Let's check our action, see what we want. I'm going to load it 96. So I'm going to load it with 96. By golly, that should look good. Just a hair over. That's okay. Now, I uh, want 93 and 90. So here's 90 thousandths of feeler gauges. You notice when I put the feeler gauges on, I use my index finger and press them closed against the fret. There'll be little gaps in here if you just leave them natural. So take them like that, put them on the fret, push down with your index finger. Tiny gap between 90 and the string. So 93, that's good enough. Little gap. Tiny little gap over there, but that's okay. I'm shooting for 87. I'm going to switch over to an 84. 84 thousandths worth. Oh, I'd like to see the B on that. A little bit of gap. And less gap over there. So I know the high E is going to be pretty close to 80 then. This is 76 thousandths worth of feeler gauges. 
I got a little gap there, so that's probably about 78. I'm shooting for 80, that's good enough. Leave it strung up. So, you know, I'm off by a thousandths, two thousandths here or there, but I dropped it quite a bit. And I'm going to leave it alone, let it settle in. The bridge pins are great. The bridge pins are nice and level now. And you still got pretty good saddle here. You know, your measurements are just um, measurements. What's really important is, is you got enough saddle, you got good brake angles on there. Those brake angles are, are very good. Very good. Yeah, that's not bad, you know. I don't want I don't want to go a whole lot lower than that, but that's acceptable. Now, the next time this guitar needs a, a major action adjustment, uh, probably we're going to reset it then. At that point, right now we've uh, we've got it good here. Your low E should be about half an inch off the top, a little bit under half an inch. I like to see the top of the low E, like pretty much right on the half inch mark. And what I've got here is that, that's perfect. The top of the low E is right under the half an inch mark. So that's good. That's perfectly acceptable. Perfectly acceptable. And again, that's just a measurement that means that everything is in geometry. There's nothing magical about half an inch, except for the fact that if you're used to it, it provides about the right amount of, of room for your fingers here. You know, I curl my fingers. If it's too low, I end up doing this with my hand, and that puts tension in my hand. So I want it about right there, and that happens to, you know, that you get used to it. That happens to be right around half an inch. So. That's pretty good, I think I'll leave that. I wouldn't kill it to be, you know, about three thousandths of an inch lower, but um, it's all right. Again, I'm going to let it sit for a while, see if it changes as a result of uh, reduced tension. I did drop the action. I started off at um, 103. I actually started off at 110. I started off at 110 here. I dropped the nut. That dropped a little bit. Then I dropped the saddle a little bit. And now I'm right at about 98 thousandths of an inch. So, you know, I dropped it enough to make a reasonable difference. And on this guitar, it's likely you use a capo on it. And when you do that, your action is going to come down to where it's pretty comfortable. Yeah, that'll be good. It'll hold up to probably about as hard as you want to need to play it. <laughs> Not as hard as you want to play it, but as hard as you need to play the thing. So let's go ahead and tune it up. When you turn it, I like to pull the strings up, pull them up here with my thumb, push down right here, that pulls everything tight against the tuner and the bridge plate. And that'll tune nicely. This is the best part. Mm. Oh. Let's see how does it play?
64 here in the shop. It's cold outside, man. It's winter storm here. good to me. Cold as my fingers are, you know. No warm-up. Um, that's good, you know, to be able to pull it off like that. Pretty good. And um, it's not bad. It would not kill it for me, personally, to be just a hair lower on the, on the bass, but uh, it's totally playable. It's better. I like it better than it was a while ago. It's got a good neck on it, you know. Guitar, it's comfortable. I uh, sure like the bridge pins a lot better now. They're not in the way. They look good. Um, everything looks nice on it. I want one of these. <laughs> ah, my fingers are cold. What else can we do?
Good. I'm going to put it up for a little bit. That's how it works. That's what you do when you evaluate a guitar. Um, things to watch out for. Don't just go randomly adjusting the saddle just because the action is high. Check out everything. Make sure you figure out why the action is high. So in this case, the action was just a little high. I looked at the nut, I looked at the relief, and I made my decision based upon that. I ended up lowering the nut slots just a little bit. I dropped the action a little bit, and then I was able to take less off of the saddle, and it plays better up in the first couple of frets as a result. So um, I did not end up having to do a neck reset on it just yet. And it might even come back in and drop just a hair more off of that saddle on the low E. I might not. I might just leave it alone. Because, um, you know, I'm not the owner of the guitar. So it plays good. I mean, obviously, you know, I love to play. And then, of course, when you're playing rhythm and that kind of thing, uh, you want a little bit of a higher action. Unless you have a really super good controlled right hand where you're not going to flail away. But, you know, it's good for me. Uh, it's good for me. So, okay. Hope you enjoyed the video.